We are recording. So when he says next slide, just click on that one, yep. please. For the next, click the like the bottom. Yep. Next slide, please, Bert. So just to touch on uh, those MCIs. Uh, so the difference between multiple casualty and multiple patients is going to differ on your service generally. So a uh, place like Bakerville here, where at any given time we're really only guaranteed to have two ambulances on. Something like a two vehicle MC MPC could be an MCI for us, whereas maybe a bigger center like say the Duke or something where they have more resources to pull from, it's not going to tax them and collapse their system to deal with all that stuff. So there's no gold number on what constitutes an MCI over an MPI. It's all based off of patient needs versus resources. Obviously, if you get there and you've got 20 green patients, well, that's going to be a little bit easier to manage than if you show up and have three red patients, right? So it's just kind of a thing you keep in mind as you're going. And that leads us into our golden hour. So this is just a very, very general guideline that uh, most trauma systems like to use as the golden hour. And that's the time of incident to the time of definitive care. And basically, the only definitive care in trauma is going to be surgery because you need to get them to an operating table. So uh, that's just going to be knowing which centers, like hospitals in your area, have the ability to do trauma surgery and stuff like that. Pop over to the next slide. So when we're triaging patients, whether it's an MCI or even a multiple patient incident, uh, like you guys noticed in our scenarios there that we pulled last week, <coughs> last weekend, is we've got these four designations here, red, yellow, green, black. So green being the least severe, then you go to yellow, red, and then black being obviously to see somebody that we can't do anything for. Uh, this is important because this is going to be what's going to guide our priorities for extrication. So we've got six people in the vehicle, four vehicles. We're going to do a quick rundown on who's green, red, yellow, black. And then obviously we're gonna get the most serious reds out first. The green should be able to self remove themselves and then we'll leave the yellows for last because it's generally just gonna be fractures and stuff like that to the yellows. I'm hearing that you have to speak up a okay. little bit more, please. Whereas uh, the reds are gonna need uh, the most urgent treatment. So those are gonna be our uh, priority there. So what qualifies you for each of these is greens when we show up to a scene, we just, try to separate out who we call the walking wounded. So these are people, maybe they've got a broken arm or something, but they're able to get themselves from point A to your treatment area or transport area. And then anyone who can't move is at least gonna be a yellow or worse. So you go to assess them. Uh, most places run off the start triage model. If you guys wanted to look that up later, I'll just go over the criteria quick, but don't think you're gonna be tested on it though, unless it says it specifically in your book. This is just for a little bit of insight as to what we're thinking medical side of things here. Uh, so we use an acronym RPM where we go respirations, pulse, motor. So if you have respirations and they're over 30, you're automatically a red. And if they're not, then we're going to keep you at a yellow. And then we jump down to the P, which is pulse. Do they have a radial pulse or do they not? If they do and it's over 100, then we say they're red. If they don't have a pulse, we're going to say they're black. And if it's at the normal limits, then you're yellow and you're kind of sit in the middle of that spectrum. And the last is mentation. So we don't do a full GCS, we don't do arm strength, anything like that. It's can you follow simple commands and are you comprehending what I'm saying to you? So if I ask you to touch your nose or wink an eye and you can do that, then I'm just going to keep you at yellow. But if you're having trouble or you seem altered in any way, then you're red. And those are just only three criteria for triage. Triage is set up to just give quick and dirty so we can assess what our priorities are for our objectives, like Chief Rose was talking about there. Uh, you always want to have those in mind. And again, blacks are just people that are deceased when we get on scene, and because we're overtaxed, any other day we might give them a little bit more attention, but because we have other people that are viable, we just leave them to take the black. Uh, so are there any questions on yeah, triage, anything like that? questions? All right, so we'll bump down to our next slide. And this is going over patient entanglement. entanglement. So they're trying to get at, uh, we try and take the vehicle apart around the patient whenever possible. The less you're manipulating these people and they're in this situation, the better they might have complicated fractures, stuff like that. So 
the less you move, the patient better. So a big one that I've seen in my days, people speak, always getting caught around gas pedals, brake pedals, stuff like that. Uh, if you guys have the small little cutters, those are perfect for that. To just reach in there, cut off the gas pedal, and you're good to go. Uh, and then the next slide here is just a summary. They just ask, what's the golden hour? Like you said, it's just the minute from the accident happens to so the first hour up to that. That's where you want to get that definitive care. Then we move on to objective two. So objective two is going over the mechanisms of injury in car accidents. And with each one of these different types of accidents, there's injury patterns that become more or less prevalent throughout them. So we'll jump down to the first one, which will be head-ons. So like you see here, face, head, neck, chest, abdominal, and other. So head-ons are probably going to be your most violent form, other than a rollover where someone strain just because you got two vehicles that are closely combating each other's injury in there or energy sorry uh so head-on collisions the big ones are face head neck injuries uh so our priority on this is just determining the severity of that so uh the big thing with head injuries like soft tissue injuries on the head that i found is that they're a lot more distracting than they generally are serious so the scalp will bleed like crazy uh, so try and look through that, and we're just looking for things that are like airway compromised. Is this person coughing up blood? Is their face grossly deformed in this? <clears throat> um, and then watch skull fractures can also be a part of this. Uh, C-spine injury, I think everyone's fairly comfortable with that. Neck tenderness, stuff like that. Uh, and then they have cartilage rings in the trachea or windpipe can be collapsed. So I'm yet to see this in my career, but it is a possibility that they can have that kind of damage there. Uh, chest injuries, this is a big one where you want to know is that patient been restrained or not? Is they wearing a seatbelt? Did airbags go off? And then if that's yes or no, we got to think of what that patient impacted inside the vehicle after that happened. So unrestrained patients hitting a steering wheel, you're going to have high cause you're injuring your lungs, heart, all your vital organs. Um, and then moving down to the abdomen, probably one of the two most common injuries in abdominal trauma are going to be your splenic ruptures. So you rupture your spleen or your liver is another big one. So your liver has this massive ligament that comes down right over the middle of it. And so heavy decelerations, even if it's not a huge impact, will cause that ligament to sever and tear into the liver, which is super vascular organ. And that's where you get major, major pains out of. Um, they also mentioned torn aorta in here, but if someone tears their aorta, they're just going to be dead when you show up. You've got about 30 seconds to live after that. So. You mean it's not like where it's an enemy, where they live forever after they tear their <laughs> No, no, unless it's a very small tear, but generally in trauma, it's either an all or none thing. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, compressed bruised lungs are another one they kind of mentioned in here, and again, we aren't doing very detailed surveys on scene, even as EMS, once that patient's out, our goal is to get them to the hospital. So if the patient's having any trouble breathing or chest pains, those are things we note, but there's not a whole lot I can do to treat that or anyone until they get to an operating table. And then we'll go down to side impact collisions. There we go. So again, this is just breaking down what this person collided with when they were in the vehicle. So side impact collisions, there's a high suspicion for cervical spine injury here because you just get that whipping to the side and then also a counter whips when it goes to the other side there. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much similar to the head-on. Just remember the patient's driver or passenger, that side that was collided with the vehicle is generally going to be the most damaged side. Uh, and then we'll go down to rear impact collisions on our slides here. Uh, so these are generally low speed, but with distracted driving and stuff like that, you are starting to see them pop up on the highways. I've seen a couple of guys drive themselves into like semi trailers or buses, just not paying attention. Um, and again, it's going to be a little bit different. So the person driving the car that was impacting the rear of the vehicle is going to have all the same repeated injury patterns as we get in head on collisions, whereas the person driving the vehicle that was rear ended again, this is kind of like a neck injury. To get that initial back, and then when they stop, it slings forward. Their bodies are strained, but it's head and neck tend to wobble quite a bit. 
Oh, and then rotational impact here. Yeah, same as head-on, same as side impact. So these all overlap quite a bit. The only other one that's uh, overly specific is rollovers. And in rollovers, they can end very well for the patient, but if they're unrestrained, you got to think that guy just bouncing around. So things we want to check are how many times did the vehicle roll, uh, where is the patient in the vehicle compared to where he was or she was when this thing rolled. So if you just got one driver, but you find him in the back seat, that's something to maybe take note of as to start thinking this is going to be a little bit more serious. And then also look for ejected patients and rollovers too if they're unrestrained. That uh, pretty much seals up section two. If anyone's got any questions about that stuff, that brings us into objective three here, which would be our. I don't have that slide. This brings us to our farm equipment injuries here. So again, they just review. So maybe these objectives be familiar with these review questions at the end. They keep coming up, so I'm sure you're gonna see that to the future. Okay, so Sorry, can you, you, you need to speak up. Speak up we're fighting over the uh, furnace. Okay, sounds good. So quite a bit louder, please. Okay, so objective three is our farm equipment injuries. Uh, so there's two main things that they have listed here is our PTO shafts uh, that you're going to use to all your attachments. I'm not overly familiar with farming, so forgive me, my knowledge is just what was in this book here. On uh, then hydraulic fluid injection. So we'll go over the PTO shafts first. Uh, it says they cause traumatic injuries due to the amount of force involved. And the type of force in a PTO injury generally is going to be a twisting, bending. Uh, so they're fairly complicated injuries to deal with. Uh, I've never done one in my career, but I've never really been around farm equipment or anywhere that would until I came to big. Um, just keep in mind the path of destruction this is going to cause. If the person got their arm caught in it, and it just wrapped their arm around, that's a little bit different than if it caught their arm and flipped them over the thing and then drug them around a couple of times. So try and piece together the event as best you can and then assess your patient to have a high suspicion for the force of travel from that injury. Uh, lastly here on this one is the hydraulic fluid injections. Uh, this one is a pretty bad one, although it's pretty rare. Uh, so it says here, systems do not de-energize even after lockout or takeout. So it's kind of like your downriggers on like an aerial where they'll go out and they'll extend, but that system's still holding pressure and that's what's keeping them extended. Most hydraulic systems work similarly to that. So just because the engine's off and we cut the battery, we still got to be cognizant that there are pressurized lines hanging around. Let's see our pinhole leak. It release fluid at 600 feet per second, which is pretty wild saying the cutoff for firearms is 300 feet per second. So we're doubling that fluid that can puncture your clothing and then go right into your skin. The big problem with oil is that it's very necrotic and as soon as that's in there it just starts killing tissue and it can get very deep and they're very hard to clean out. Uh, and then again if we are in an extrication situation with this is we're carry, carrying our hydraulics out as well so watch your own hydraulic lines around pinch points. When we show up it's generally a pretty static environment not a lot of things are moving Around, but as we start moving, cutting, just remember that every time we push something in one direction, something's going to move the opposite direction there. So just a seat safety tip there to make sure our hydraulics are under control as well. And then it just has a review question, just asking what the two common types of farm injuries are. So assuming this, once you to be able to break it down into those two there, away you go. That there's no questions on farm equipment, we'll jump on to administering care in the field. So, uh, first step here is they have protect patients from hazards, including hazardous extrication techniques. So, what are some things that we're going to want to protect our patient from during extrication, and how we should go about that? So, the most common ones I've seen is uh, home departments will carry pieces of popcorn. So as soon as you start cutting doors and stuff like that, you should always have something like that between the tool and the patient. And that just, again, it's going to be, everyone's going to be pretty amped up. And the last thing you want to do is nick a patient or move a patient with the tool or even with a piece of metal. I know there's one scenario we were doing there last week where they were thinking of maybe cutting the steering wheel. And just the force of cutting that, move the steering wheel, is pushing on the patient a bit. And the guy's caught it right away, which is good. But 
again, it's something you've got to watch, especially in these crumpled tight environments. Uh, mobilizing C-spine. Now, depending on what your operational procedures are in your fire departments, uh, most people should get a C-collar in the vehicle as soon as the neck's been assessed, and then that's just one extra set of hands that we don't have to be so precise and worried about holding C-spine on there. Uh, after that, we go support the ABCs. Uh, generally, in the car during the extrication, there's very little we do with this. If someone needs minor airway maneuvers, like a jaw thrust, we can do that to keep your C-spine in line and maintain their airway, but unless it's going to be an extremely prolonged extrication, then we usually don't do advanced airways or anything like that in the car, just because of the space and time that takes. And number four is generally going to be your biggest one. Uh, most of the time you go to power accidents, at least in my experience, the people are awake, they're just in pain, pretty banged up. So providing psychological support through extrication. So we kind of went over this uh, on our critique with the cheap row there about you're going to have to provide psychological support to the patient and the other people in the vehicle. So just knowing what things to say, what things to not say is another big one. So again, we don't want to lie. We don't want to set unreal expectations for our patients, but if they are in a shock state, the last thing we want to have to do is break the news that one of their family members or friends has also died in that same vehicle. So uh, try to use a little bit of tact when you're doing that, but still be supportive and a little bit human at the same time to uh, help them out. Uh, they touch on providing oxygen therapy. Generally, this is just done with the simple mask or nasal cannula. Uh, if the patient is so out of it that they need assistance breathing, we can get a BVM in there. But again, unless it's absolutely needed, we try to keep that treatment stuff to a minimum in the car and wait till the patient's out. Uh, monitoring cardiac activity. Again, this is one of those things that you can do, but uh, generally, fire's going to be so busy in the car cutting apart, like there's just no room for a cardiac monitor and all that. So we generally wait till afterwards. Uh, and then they mentioned certain medications. Again, unless it's an extreme circumstance where this patient's going to take a couple hours to get out of there, the treatment's very, very minimal until they're actually out of the vehicle. So. Uh, and then immobilizing and packaging the patient for removal. So I'm sure you guys have gone over a couple different ways. So we've got our long board, we've got our KED, or you can use a short board as well. Um, I've only ever used the KED once. And it wasn't at a car accident, it was someone just wedged in a basement. It was easy to get out. The kid's nice, the only problem is it takes a lot of time to set up. So if your patient's at all unstable or you're questioning their stability, then the kid's are probably not going to be your first choice. And you just go with the long board because it's nice and quick to lay it down. Um, and we got it down to B here. So fractures and lacerations. So there's high potential for cervical injury, obviously, in all car accidents. Uh, especially in a place like Bakerville here, where we've got a high elderly population, you go and start to get brittle. So even something that might not seem like a big deal when we're showing up, always have that high suspicion and rule it out, and then go from there. Uh, they just touch on cervical collars, but we've already talked about that. Sorry, uh, Kirk, are we on, what slide are we on? Uh, we should be on the other possible effects. What's, uh, what's the number on the bottom of the slide? 12-20. Twenty. Okay, I'm so too far ahead. Sorry. Oh, no worries. There we go. Sorry. Uh, so hypovolemia obviously is a big one. So we're going to get massive bleeding. If there's any abdominal trauma, that's a high, high suspicion of hypovolemic shock. Uh, so if you can stop the bleeding, if it's an extremity or something like that, direct pressure. If that doesn't work, we'll jump up to a tourniquet. That's something that's quick, easy, can be put on the car, help us with our extrication there and buy us a little bit of time. Uh, keep in mind, we're getting into the winter months. Like I said, those head lacerations and stuff, those can bleed really bad. But I find in the cold, uh, people don't bleed a whole lot when they're cold. But then once we get them into the ambulance, they warm up, their blood vessels dilate, and those things can start leaking like crazy. So it's really important if you're moving the patient from a cold environment to a warm environment, just reassess your bandaging and stuff like that because that's where it'll creep up on you. Uh, and then they come down to D, so hypothermia. This is actually a huge, huge one that they're starting to find in trauma studies coming out of the military. He was the one talking to me about this, actually. Uh, so hypothermia is just a decrease in body temperature. So anyone who's colder than 36 degrees, we're going to say is generally hypothermic. 
Uh, increased chances of wet clotting, lack of normal heating, weather, duration of exposure. So what they're trying to get at there is our body is maintained at a very specific pH, very specific temperature. Uh, when that temperature starts to fluctuate, whether it's higher or lower, that interferes with a lot of things. The first one's our clotting system. So our body can't form clots properly when it's cold, which is obviously a problem if you've got an abdominal bleed. So keeping someone warm is more than just keeping them warm for comfort. It's actually a physiological reason behind it. Uh, another thing that happens is your body doesn't pick up and release oxygen properly at the blood cell level anymore when you're cold. So even if we put a, an a SpO2 monitor on this patient and it's telling us 100%, uh, their arterial saturation is probably going to be quite a bit lower than that. And it's there's a graph that shows that. We don't need to go into that stuff here. Uh, and then they go over rewarming techniques. Uh, this is one that uh, we kind of want to be a little bit careful with. They touch on warm IV fluids. We don't want to warm people up any more than a degree an hour is generally the accepted route. So we're going to touch on crush syndrome here, but kind of what happens is your body shuts down those blood vessels peripherally to keep your core warm. And if you warm them up right away, you've got all this toxic blood that hasn't been circulating properly in your extremities, and that will shock your system, and you're basically poisoning yourself with it layman's terms here. So you can do warm IV fluids, but watch how fast you're warming them up. Uh, my preferred method would be to strip the patient down and just warm blankets, maybe some hot packs in their armpits behind their neck. Um, and also keep in mind that although jackets keep your warm body warm in the cold, they're going to keep your cold body cold as well. So it might seem tempting if they've got big jackets on to keep that stuff on once you get them into the ambulance or if you have a treatment area set up, but that stuff's all got to go off. It's the same way a cooler keeps your ears cold in the summertime, the jacket's going to keep a cold body cold even if it's warm. It's just an insulator. It doesn't make you warm. The only reason it keeps you warm is because you're already warm. So. And then just be familiar with the same way fire is transferred, that's the same way that we can lose heat in our body too, so convection, radiation. So keep them off the ground, the cold ground, that prevents the radiation, put a blanket over them and then that stops the convection of losing it. And also keep them dry as well. Uh, when you're wet, you lose body heat, it's like 30 to 40 percent faster than someone who's dry. So if there's any sort of liquids anywhere, make sure to get them off of them. Um, and then they just touch on, you can use warm air through the use of a heater blower. We don't have that here, but I know lots of hospitals have, they call it like the bear hugger blankets, and that just circulates warm air around the patient's body. And again, that's using convection, which is generally your fastest way to warm somebody up. Uh, and then we go on to this one here. So we've got touch on hazardous materials here. So remove the patient from the source of exposure as long as it's safe for yourself to do so. Uh, remove material from the patient, <clears throat> and then depending on what the chemical is, you could do anything from brush it off to rinse it off. Um, if you're not sure, you can always reference your ERG if you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, maybe a poison control call or something like that, and they'll be able to provide you further assistance from there. Um, the other thing they say is respiratory protection, and again, that's for the patient and yourself. Probably more so yourself, too, because that patient will have already been exposed to it if you're there. It's just make sure you're not blowing any chemicals in the face or anything like that. On the next, we're going to go down to the next slide here uh, for prolonged entrapment. So, so we're going to touch on crush injury first. Um, so what happens in a crush injury, a true crush injury, is someone's limb extremity has been trapped and it's shut down circulation going into that limb and returning. So like I said, with the hypothermia, when you get cold, you start to get all that toxic blood because it's not able to get the waste out and get oxygen in. Exact same thing happens in crush injury, except we've got to be cognizant that if we're taking this person out of this situation, that we're going to give that automatic release right away. So if someone who truly has crush injury, uh, you want to do a couple things to assess the severity of it right away. So let's say, for example, someone's been in an accident and a post collapses on their leg. We want to know if they're a candidate for crush syndrome or not. Uh, we're going to just check that leg lower than the injury. So we want to see, is there good skin color there? 
uh, do a cap refill. So just push in on the skin, does blood return? If not, you probably are in a hypoperfused state. You're not getting enough oxygen there and you're not dishing off stuff. Um, that's something to let the medics know, or if you happen to be the medical personnel on site, uh, that's a patient who's probably a candidate to have a tourniquet put on them. And then you extricate, so that tourniquet's acting as the thing that's crushing them. And then it's a slow release at the hospital. They will do that. Even at an ALS level, we don't touch. It's just such a complicated thing to deal with that you want to have blood work and you want to have a full resuscitation team ready. Uh, down. Uh, things we can do, though, is make sure we're giving high flow oxygen. Um, they say large volumes of intravenous fluid. Again, this is just to kind of preload the patient for when those toxins are released. It kind of dilutes them a little bit. Cardiac monitoring, uh, your electrolytes are going to go out of whack here, uh, and certain medications that will help with those acid, uh, the acidic blood that's coming through. But again, that's probably a hospital thing. We don't even have protocols for that. So, um, And then they have simple guidelines here. So generally, anything over 60 minutes of being crushed is going to be a candidate for crushed uh, syndrome. Um, say limb swells and stretch to maximum, it will have a distended look to it, and they need advanced life support care and aggressive surgery to save the limb. So in all reality, it's probably something we're going to be calling STARS to come pick up, and they'll be taking it off our hands right after the extrication there. Um, and then lastly, they touch on uh, field amputations here. Uh, it's a little bit aggressive for our level of care here. <laughs> Uh, this will be something that you're calling STARS for, and I'm assuming they're going to be sending their doctor out, so you're not just going to get a paramedic and an RT show up for this. Uh, but we should know what the indications are for this, so we know when we see it, when to make that call if we need someone more than what we can offer here. So basically, if the person's limb is trapped and they need life-saving care, and you don't think they have time for the two hour extrication to make sure that their shin is out from underneath the car, then that might be a candidate. It's generally for building collapses, or you can see it even on a farm if a grain silo falls over on someone. You might need to just take the limb there. But again, that's something we call stars for and just say this is what we're looking at, and they might be able to offer you more advice or send a team out for it. Uh, yeah, so after that, we'll go to our next slide. I think it's just a review question on this one. Yeah. All right, now coordinating with medical personnel. So, so they have some chief problems that will be present at the time of extrication. So there's usually a delay in reaching the trap patients. So not everyone crashes right in the middle of a nice highway where we have quick access to them. They can be rolled down an embankment or say it is a farming injury, like a tractor rollover. You might have a bit of time just to get to where the patient is. Um, unusual medical problems not based on a regular basis. So again, instead of just having an isolated injury, these people are generally have a few things going on with them. Everything from fractures to internal bleeds and you've got to manage that all or be ready to. Uh, they touch on the inability to scoop and run with seriously injured victims. So obviously if these people were just laying on the sidewalk for us to pick up, it would be a nice easy grab and go for us. But with extrication time in there, we've got to balance patient care with getting them out to where they're at. And medical system chaos, secondary to loss of communications, uh, or overwhelm, compromise EMS providers and hospitals. This is generally going to be in your MCIs here, um, that's why good solid standard operating guidelines are good because then everybody knows what their task is or should know what their task is when they show up and then just fall into that role based off of that. Um, oh yeah, and I've got a note here. <clears throat> Again, this is probably more of an officer level decision, but during your walk around and seed size up, that's when you got to start making the calls for extra resources, not when you've got the patient out and they're ready to go because you want to get everyone moving there as soon as possible. So if you note something that you think is going to be need to address straight away, but we don't have the capability to address that, that's something to communicate to your officer so they can make that phone call, whether it be a bus for multiple patients that just need to stay warm in the winter, or something serious like getting stars flying. That's kind of something to throw up the chain of command there. 
Uh, and with MCIs, make sure you uh, notify the hospital as soon as possible of what's going on. That way they have time to organize their trauma team or teams uh, if there's multiple, multiple patients. I know this thing in Las Vegas there, they did an interview with one of the surgeons and they said it was because of that early pre-notification. By the time these shooting victims started, they already had like 12 surgeons ready to go. So we can make a difference in that way of just getting things down the line moving before the patients show up. It makes things so much smoother. Uh, and that's pretty much all they had for that one there. So we'll jump on to the next slide. And we're just going to go over packaging procedures. So we did quite a bit of this in the scenarios. Pretty much everyone should have got in on this last week there. Our uh, primary concern is going to be that the scene's safe, but after that, uh, in accidents, you want to go right to C-spine and then start your assessment. So uh, I find a big thing is like yelling out to the patient as you're walking up to them. Uh, maybe wait till you get right there and the first thing out of your mouth should be something to the effect of stay nice and still for me. We're just going to check you out first because if you're asking them a bunch of questions and yelling to them as you're walking up, they're going to be looking around all sorts of things and they're just in a position to have a compromised uh, spinal injury after that. Um, so initially, we're going to start out with just a couple of gloved hands holding C-spine. You usually get someone in the car. Uh, this picture is a truck, so it doesn't exactly illustrate my example. But if you can get right behind the patient, it's generally going to be the most comfortable for you. Uh, once you're assigned this job, you're generally stuck at it. So if you make sure you're somewhere you're going to be comfortable as possible, sitting there for up to an hour sometimes. Um, and just because you put a C collar on someone, they still do need someone holding that. Your job's going to be a little bit easier because they have that collar on there as a reminder not to move, but they still have the ability. So until they're strapped down to the board completely, we do want hands on that head, even if it's just a reminder uh, to the patient to stay. Um, yeah, don't unnecessarily bend or twist patients. So we did have that one scenario last week there where there's a patient in a van and he was quite a tall gentleman and to twist him out of the van was going to be kind of a pain so we ended up just taking the b post out and then the guys had a ton of room to get him out there without the twisting bending stuff like that uh, another one in a truck that i've seen done is you can take the b posts and then do a reverse uh, roof flap and then you can just pop that guy straight out the back and there's no twisting involved it's just a straight up lift and this guy here might be a candidate for the tent for that reason. Or you can just put it on him in the seating position, lift him straight out, and there's no, none of the twisting to get onto the board involved. And again, you're going to weigh that over patient's condition and the likelihood of C spine injury, right? Is this something we're doing as a precaution, or is this something we're doing because the patient's got numbness, tingling in his toes? Those are two different ways to handle that patient. Um, Again, this isn't in your book. I know, I want to say it was Nevada is doing a trial right now with their EMS. Uh, doing self-extrications of patients. So what they'll do is they'll put the collar on and the patient will wiggle themselves into position on the board with the instructions that if you feel any pain or anything changes, you tell us and we stop right away. Uh, the mentality behind that is that if you've got a pinched nerve even in your back and someone tries to lift you onto a bed, like it's gonna cause pain, uncontrolled movement. But if you're conscious, you have a back or neck fracture, the second you move into a position, your body automatically stops, right? Think when you get a stitch in your back, that's kind of what they're coming at it with. So maybe something to keep your eyes on in the literature and that comes out in the next couple of years. And on the pipe. So it's a neat concept to think of. And again, always constant communication with these patients for exactly that reason. So just give them a heads up. We're going to move you onto this board, yellow, loud, if you hear, feel anything off. And we'll stop there, and then it's maybe you got to change your game plan at that point. Oh, yeah, C spines needed by almost every person extricated from a vehicle. Uh, my eyes, if we're cutting you out of a vehicle, it's probably serious enough that 100% of my patients are going to be getting C collars on. So. And you can always take it off, but if you haven't put it on and something screws up, putting it on after the fact isn't going to help a thing. So. Risk versus benefit there a little bit. Who can make that determination to take it off? Probably only a paramedic or? Uh, paramedic EMT. Alberta yeah. Health Services does have a protocol in place. Oh, they do? For uh, their fine. They just don't want patients on spine boards for a long time. It causes pressure sores, especially mm -hmm. old people. Uh, so we're told we don't transport on boards. The boards to get you on the stretcher, and then we slide it out. 
and then we just leave the collar on. I, if there's a collar on, I don't think there'd be a situation I would ever take it off. And it's, it's just something I take. So is that something that we do take? Or like, I mean, I've never seen them come off the board. Is that something you guys do inside the unit? Inside the, if oh. there's a prolonged transport. Now, if we're just transporting to Bakerville, just for ease of transferring, I usually leave them on there. Right. But if you're going into the city, yeah, we'll roll them up, slide the board out, and you're just on a collar on that soft oh. bed. Yeah. I think the protocol is uh, transport over 30 minutes. Yeah, I think 30 minutes is the cutoff for that. And you keep them off. What's that protocol called? Is that the... It'll be under the C-spine assessment in your adult I remember. Calls. I remember hearing about it. It's, it's... Do you keep the blocks on still when you do that? Or no, that so the on? whole board, everything. Oh, so it's keep... literally just the collar? Yep, just the collar and then, and again, the strict instructions that you're to stay still. So if that patient's altered at all, though, remember how I mentioned yeah. quick commands, if he can't touch his nose or you're talking to him, but he's not quite getting the message for whatever reason, always err on the side of caution of that because the risk of bed sores is going to be fairly low or is the risk of someone being a little out of it and further injuring themselves. Could yeah. you use the could you use the rolled uh, rolled blankets in, in lieu of the blocks on the oh, stretcher? For sure. if, on the stretcher, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then it gives you that extra little bit of safety there, yeah, for sure. But as a general rule, we're extricating full ceasefire precautions and if if you're not medically trained, just leave it at that. Let someone else make that decision. You've got the liability insurance and all that stuff. It's kind of the way I look at it. Um, and then they just kind of go over some devices here. So they got the long board. I take it everyone's fairly familiar with the long board. It's just as you see in this picture. Uh, when we're putting people on there, as a general rule, we like to secure the torso first. Uh, then the head, then the legs. The reason for that is if they have to vomit or you need to manipulate that board, torso is the heaviest part so if you got to flip them and you're halfway through it at least their torso is on there and that's the spine that's the main thing we're concerned about anyways their legs moving around that's a minimal thing um yeah so okay. when you say the torso are you talking the top shoulder straps or yep. the waist straps nope, top shoulder okay. straps yep yep, yep. that heaviest part of the body there uh, and then they have seated spinal immobilization so the big one is always the head uh, it's designed to mobilize seated spinal injured patients, just like you see here. And like I said, this is generally going to be done on a stable patient that's been entrapped. So we have no suspicion of internal hemorrhage, no suspicion of anything that would require that golden hour to really be met, because this does take some time to set up, but it keeps the patient in that nice position there. And you really don't have to worry about the twisting, anything like that. Uh, I've yet to see it used on a car accident. I've heard of only a couple times. It's a pretty unorthodox thing that we do. We're just maybe not familiar with it, but uh, in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion, but it's kind of more trouble than it's worth on a car accident scene. Again, it's a nice tool to have. One day you're going to come across a situation where this is going to be just awesome. But as a general rule, most extrications are going to be used just a long or short board. So after they they when they're in the ked, what's the rule? Do they need to go on a spine board after that, or yeah. can they go on the stretcher with a with just a ked on? I would probably be putting them on a spine board after that. Yeah. Uh, pediatrics, I know some guys have done just the ked with pediatric, but it usually covers most of the length of their body, anyways. Uh, but yeah, I'd still be putting someone on a scoop or again with our new protocol, we can just put them on the thing under the straps. I would probably leave that thing underneath them. Just undone, just because the manipulation to get it out to get your patient. It's not just a quick roll, slide out, and go. What else do we have? Oh, here we go. So, children in car seats, um, use these to your advantage. Just like you see here, we did have the one car seat, but we didn't have a big baby in it on our accident. Um, but just like you see here, if you've got a child in a car seat, your booster seat, that's your spine board and it's nice easy extrication unless there's any complicating factors like a crush compartment, passenger compartment or anything like that. But it's easy as just putting two rolled blankets, towels, pillows, whatever you have beside their head, strap them down. And I think your biggest challenge on immobilizing these guys is going to be just keeping them calm. You're probably taking them away from mom or grandma, right? So if possible, bring a parent with you, but if that's not uh, viable by any reason, have to call on your soft skills there a little bit and do your best. You've got teddy bears, but this is going to be a pretty rough transport, I would assume. 
that's a pretty scary time. Um, no, it doesn't affect us too much, but what is the protocol for EMS for uh, strapping the car seat into your units? Uh, the protocol is that any pediatric has to be in a car seat, and you're just gonna have to make that work with whatever seat belts we have in there. We did take one out, and because our uh, seat belts didn't fit in there quite right, we ended up just using two straps for the stretcher to qualify seat belts and cinching them down, and that kid wasn't going anywhere on that thing. So that's also another option there. And it makes it nice for us. The airway chairs have the flip down, but then that patient's stuck in kind of an odd spot to be treated, right? So. Uh, I think I'll probably always go with the stretch car seat on the stretcher, two straps, and then that kid's right there where we usually work on them in the middle of everything. It's kind of happy. So, yeah. Yeah, they always have to be secured in for you. Uh, and then basket type litter. So, this is kind of something that you generally see in like high angle, confined space rescue type situations. But again, these car accidents can be sometimes high angle situations, maybe not so much. Bakerville, we're pretty flat here, uh, but people going over embankments or anything like that, uh, this is a great thing. Or even ditches sometimes. Uh, I have seen this used in the winter time. You know, when the ditches get snow, it like got past your knees. That's a super nice option to have that hold on to versus just the spine board. It's not as much the wire one, but the uh, plastic ones, yeah, for yeah. sure. So yeah, and then it distributes that weight to that person. They just will sit on the snow like big snowshoes. So actually, what some uh, what some departments are doing with these wire baskets is they're uh, putting a crazy carpet and uh, underneath it, and then basically weaving uh, weaving rope or something uh, something along the side. And then that way, it, it, that basket will slide along snow. But yeah, yeah. if you got to haul a patient from 100 feet, 50 feet in, in a field that they rolled and it's full of snow, yeah, why, uh, you know, why, why risk your knee injuries and slipping and falling, carrying, carrying that spine board? Yep, yeah, put, them, put them on the spine board, get them in that, and away Especially you go. Especially with the size of a lot of people these days. Like, I'm sure you've all handled spine boards where you've got to, like, dig under the patient to get at that handle. As you can see on these guys, you got to handle the whole way around that. So if you need five guys on each side, <laughs> there's room for everywhere to grab there. You're not limited to just these three spots you can touch. So, yeah. Again, these are all tools that you guys will review in this, but a lot of it is just making up your, like you said, you go over your incident action plan when you get up there, like two scene, and it's just, okay, I know what we have, now what do we apply to this situation? So there's no one size fits all for these necessarily. Uh, they do make a note here, and this is important, that the basket is not for spinal immobilization. So if you've got a scoop or a spine board, you can use that, but it does have to go inside of this basket. I think most places I've seen usually store the spine board in the basket anyway. So and only on the uh, the basket, like, there are basket stretchers that are considered spine boards. Like we have one. Okay. But uh, you also have to you have to weave with uh, with webbing to, to to keep them immobilized. So there you go. Yeah. So again, and that's another thing of just making sure you're really familiar with your SOGs and your specific equipment. Uh, and then the review question is, what devices can be used? So it's just the ones we went over here. And we'll just jump over to our next slide here. Uh, so this is just going over follow-up on patient information. Um, so describe post-incident follow-up and education <laughs> procedures. Uh, most of the time, unless you get in with some nurses somewhere, you generally don't know how these patients turn out. But uh, after any major event like this, we usually do sit down as a crew. Uh, a lot of times with Fire EMS, where I come from, it was integrated, so we're all kind of one operation. And if there was anything we pulled the tools out for to cut some out, you were going to have an after incident. We just call them critiques. And we basically just go around with what went well, what could we have done better, and then kind of go over, okay, if we had this one back, now what would we do kind of thing if it didn't go so well? Uh, but these are important. Uh, if you have more than one agency in on a big incident, it's probably a good idea to have everyone in on some sort of critique. You can all do your individual ones, but uh, just then everyone knows within the team, 
how things work. A big one is always staging, like on major events, because everyone flocks to the incident scene and then you've got 10 patients and we've got to figure out how to get ambulances and police through. So all those are always hot topics on those, as well as any concerns anyone had or room for improvement. And that's kind of how you revise your SOGs and SOPs and stuff on the floor like that. So. Uh, but yeah, they just want you to know what it is and that it's a process to gather information on a call. That's all they really touch on there. And then that brings us to our summary and review. So, very big one, patient care is the essence and primary purpose of any rescue, rescue operation. So, right after our safety comes their safety, right? So we make sure we're taken care of and then we're able to help them out. Uh, and extrication aside, we're always there for the person. It's awesome cutting cars apart, but that decision should always be based on what's best for that person that's inside, from fire, EMS, police, whoever's responding there. Uh, all agencies that participate in extrications should ensure they have sound OGs and a good interagency working relationship between responders who perform the extrication and those who provide medical treatment. So again, here I feel we've got a pretty good relationship between fire, police, EMS. That's not always the case, but remember, we're all there for the patient, victim, whatever you want to call them. And it's kind of a thing, you got to leave your ego at the door and uh, just stick to the OGs to get this done and then go from there. So yeah, the best way to do it is together for sure. Um, I think that's it for slides. So we'll just go over some review questions. So I'll just touch on them here, seeing this is only three of us here. Uh, so uh, what is the golden hour? So we're saying that's time of injury to one hour post injury. That's important because that's when we want that person, at least in an ER, if not on an operating table. Uh, what types of injuries are caused by head on impact collisions? There's going to be chest injuries, facial injuries, a lot of abdominal trauma. Uh, and a classic one, like people snap their collarbones from seatbelts and stuff like that. You see those marks as well quite often too. Uh, what two common injuries associated with farm equipment? We said our two main mechanisms are going to be PTO shafts and hydraulic fluid rejections. Uh, patient care procedures and must, what patient care procedures must rescuers and medical personnel be prepared to provide in the field? And that range from everything from just basic psychological support all the way down to advanced life support meditations but just understand where in that spectrum each patient would fall into and I'll think too too in depth on there uh, then they want us to review the devices that can be used so went over long boards short boards uh, KEDs and then just know the application for each of those things too uh, what tactics should an incident commander use during industrial and agricultural vehicle extrication operations? Touch on that in there, but uh, you just want to really make sure you know what you're working with. So if there's a placard on that vehicle, no one should be going near that until we've addressed what it is. And then maybe we need to set up a bigger perimeter. Maybe this is now an extrication slash hazmat event, right? You kind of have to treat it as both. Uh, and then what is the purpose of a post-incident follow-up and education? So basically what we're doing there is just looking for where we can improve for the next time. i have yet to be on one of these that has gone perfectly. There's always something you can take out of it. The big thing is just being adults about it afterwards. I have seen them just turn into finger pointing and that's just counterproductive, right? It's, you're not helping anyone. We're all on the same team here. So even if someone is obviously not meeting the standard, Encourage you to take that as an opportunity to maybe coach that guy instead of just poo -poo on him. Probably, in my experience, get better results in that way. Um, and that's all I have for you guys. Do you guys have any questions or concerns? Pretty much it. Brief chapter there. Yeah, Good job.